about, and it started actually on Resurrection Sunday because this will be part three, but talking about resurrection power. Yeah. I said talking about resurrection power. Yeah. And uh, one of the key verses that we started on back, now this will be three weeks, uh, back on Resurrection Sunday, was in Philippians chapter 3, in verse 10. Yeah. Philippians 3, actually, I'll, I'll, start, I'll start reading in verse 7. I'm going to read this right now out of the New Living Translation. And uh, this is Paul talking. And what Paul is saying here, I want you to understand, I want you to see, is he's emphasizing the importance of the resurrection power. So in verse 7 it says, I once thought all these things were so very important. Actually, let's back up even further than that. Verse 4, let's back up to verse 4. It says, yet I could have confidence in myself if anyone could. If others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. So Paul's setting a, stand, setting a, setting a tone here saying, you know, I, I could have easily have confidence in myself in the things that I've accomplished in life, yeah. just like all of us in here could. Yeah. No matter what walk of life you come from, no matter what you've done, we, we probably could all pull out some things about our lives just like, well, yeah. <laughs> you know the things that I've done. Matter of fact, if you have a conversation with somebody, you'll usually see that or hear that. Yeah. Hopefully it's not you. <laughs> if it is, just keep looking forward like nobody will know. But usually when you get into a conversation with somebody, yeah. because people, people just ultimately love to talk about themselves. Well, Can we all agree people love to talk about themselves? So usually when they're talking about themselves, they start to list the accomplishments of what they've done. It's just like, well, yeah, you know, this is what I've done. <laughs> this is what I know. Not that there's necessarily anything wrong with sharing your life with somebody, but it's the attitude behind it. So let's, let's read here. It says, yet I could have confidence in myself if anyone could. If others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. For I was circumcised when I was eight days old, having been born into the pure-blooded blood, Jewish family that is branch of the tribe of Benjamin. So I am a real Jew, if there, was, if there ever was one. What's more, I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. Wow. And zealous? <laughs> yeah. In fact, I harshly persecuted the church. And I obeyed the Jewish law so carefully that I was never accused of any fault. Wow. Think about that. Just think about the pride in that statement. Wow. Not accused of any fault. But Paul's not leaning on that. He's just making a statement here. He's just making a statement here. Verse 7. I once thought all these things were so very important. Just like many of us can be. Our past accomplishments, all the things that we've done. Notice that all the things that we've done, because that's what Paul's referencing here. Right. All of his efforts all of his work, all of his strength, all the things that he did absent of God. Hmm. Thinking God was involved, but it was really the absence of God. Because I say, yes, everything else is worthless. Verse 8. Well, actually, let's, let's read all of verse 7 first. It says, I once thought all these things were so very important, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. The King James says, I consider him dumb. I don't think I need to go into an explanation of what dumb is. But it's pretty close. It's, it's pretty, you know, God, God's getting a point across here by the Holy Ghost through Paul telling you what your accomplishments, worldly accomplishments, really are. Now, I'm not trying to say to you that accomplishments aren't wonderful, you know, and, and progressing in life and doing certain things, so on and so forth. But it's the emphasis we put on them if we think that gives us value. Yeah. If we think those things are the ones that cause, that, that tells us and others that we've arrived. They don't. No, sir. They don't. Paul will go on to say here what really is those things that show 
not necessarily that you've arrived or that you've flipped in, in your heart and seen what's really important. So it goes on to say here, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the priceless gain of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. So Paul saying everything about my life was worthless when it comes to knowing Christ. Yeah. Notice it says they're knowing Christ, yeah. not knowing about him. That's talking about relation. We always hear that Christianity is relationship. Yes. Amen? Yes. It's relationship. Mm -hmm. Paul is emphasizing that right now. Because to really have a relationship with somebody, you have to know them, not about them. Right. I know a lot about a lot of people because of the books that you read, things that I'm told, but I don't know them, so I don't have any relationship with them. True. I can tell you about them what I know because of what I've read or what I've been told, but I can't tell you anything about them because I really know them. Yeah. See, when you really know someone, you know the intricacies of their life. You know the little details of their life. Uh -huh. You see beyond this, just, just this big picture, you actually see detail. See, I know things about her that you all don't because of relationships. Yeah, and some of you in here may have a relationship with her, but my relationship's even deeper. Yeah, right. The only way you're going to know certain things about her that I know is if I tell you or she chooses to tell you. Yeah. Ain't going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not necessarily because I don't because I'm a want you to know things about her. It's just because I know what's good for me. <laughs> it's because I'm adorable. She's adorable. As one person in this church says, you're so adorable. So that's all you need to know. She's adorable. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> Paul says, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the priceless gain of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I have discarded everything else. I've discarded everything else. That's a bold statement. Yes. Have you discarded everything else? Mm -mm. There may be some things in your life you need to discard yet. Maybe some religious thoughts, religious beliefs, maybe some traditions, maybe some doctrine that doesn't quite line up with the Word of God. Yes. Some things that we've been taught. Probably every one of us in here have been taught or heard some things that are contrary to the truth. Right. Right. Amen. Contrary to the truth. Yes. And I, I, I need to say this. It's fresh in my mind because this was just recently talking about it. Let's not mistake facts for truth. Yeah. Hmm. Truth supersedes facts. Need to understand that. Yeah, we do need to understand that. Because we can, we can be dealing with a physical issue in our body, and, and even when somebody asks us, we'll say, well, the truth of the matter is, is I've got this. No, no, that's not the truth. It's fact. Right. There's a fact that's being spoken. There's something going on in your body. But the truth is now, now you have to go to find out what, but what does the truth say? The truth says that you're healed yes. by the stripes of Jesus Christ. Yes. That's what the truth That's says. The truth. And, and we need to be very careful. This is in every arena of life. We need yes. to be very careful that we don't substitute or mix the two up in our lives. Yes. Facts are facts, but truth is truth. Right. And truth, the truth of the word, because this is the only truth. Yes. Jesus, the word of God, the truth of who the Father is, yes. the Holy Ghost... This is the only truth that there is. Facts are subject to change because of the truth. Yes. I said facts are subject to change because of the truth. So don't ever think just because uh, you receive a report from a doctor... Come on. Yes. 
that that's the truth, because it's not the truth. This is the truth. It may be a fact from medical science. They're telling you something that they found. Okay, it's a fact. But that fact is subject to change by the truth. But if you think what they're telling you is the truth, it won't change. Because now your life is being governed by the facts. And if your life is governed by the facts, it won't change. That's in every arena. That's in finances as well. Because the banker will tell you, or your retirement guru that you have will tell you that, well, you'll never be able to retire. And I don't believe in retirement anyways. I'll just be honest with you. Uh, you may change your direction in life. But retirement to me just simply means that you're giving up. And now you're going to let life or lack of life begin to consume you until you leave this earth. Mm -mm. No, no, no. Mm -mm. That's not God's intention. Redirect. New purpose. New direction. Amen. But I was saying, I, I, that, that led me to say the reason is because uh, certain people that you may ask and talk to about your retirement, you know, and, and will I be okay to retire at the age of 65? Well, no, because uh, based upon statistics, based upon the facts that we presently know, the fact says that you're going to need X amount of dollars to be able to live the lifestyle that you're used to living. And if you don't put yourself on this track of saving and investing and doing all this, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with saving. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with investing. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with being a good steward. What I am saying is just because the world tells you that this is what needs to be done, to be able to live the life that you want to live, that's exactly what you'll be bound to. If it's $500,000 or $1 million, uh, and that's what you need so you can have a, 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 a monthly flow of X amount of dollars because this is the lifestyle that you like to live and, and you want, from the information that you share, you want to continue to live this type of lifestyle. Well, you're going to need this much, you know, in savings and in the stocks and in the 401k and the da, 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 annuities and so on and so forth. Y'all know what I'm talking about, the things that will bring a return. I'll tell you, this is what you have to have. And they'll even paint a bleak picture if you don't have it. And they'll even shoot your desires and your dreams down by saying, if you don't have it, you're not going to be able to retire when you're 65. Because that's kind of the age, you know, 65, 62, 65. That's just like, whoo. When you reach 62 or 65, you've arrived. Because now you can stop working. But they'll shoot your dream down because they'll say, uh, on the current saving plan that you've got right now, you'll never be able to retire at 65. You'll have to work till you're at least 70. And all of a sudden, that going into that office with the smile on your face, like thinking you're doing really good, they'll tell you you've got to work another five years and be like. Well, the thing is, is if God told you to change your direction or your purpose at the age of 65, it really doesn't make any difference what you have in 401k. That's the world's way of thinking. Yeah. That to change direction in your life or to have a different purpose in your life, which is other than working, that this is what you have to have. Come on. Why am I saying all this? Good preaching. Keeping it real. 
Say you no, know, because Paul said, I consider all those things done, those things that I've learned, those things that I've studied, those things that religion has taught me, those things that the world has taught me, those things that the pharisaical law has taught me, those things that I've been taught on how to get closer to God and be right with God. But that, that transcends over every arena of life. Everything that the world has tried to teach you, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with knowledge. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with, with gaining knowledge even in the world as in the sense of, you know, going to college and learning a trade and so on and so forth. But God's truth transcends all of that. And that's what Paul is saying here. All of the things that I was trained in, all the things that I was taught in, all the things that I deemed important, all the things that I trusted in, all the things that I depended upon. I'm saying I am not dependent upon those things anymore. What I'm going to begin to become dependent upon is knowing Christ. And he goes on to say here, I no longer count on my own goodness or my ability. Everyone say my ability. My ability. I'm not dependent on my, my ability, ability to obey God's law. But I trust Christ to save me. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. God's way of making us right with him depends on faith. That crosses the boundaries and the barriers of everything that we know in this world. God's way of becoming rich depends on faith. God's way of being healed depends on faith. God's way of accomplishing the purposes and the plans that he has for our life depends on faith. Seeing ourselves as God sees us Depends, our, depends on faith. Everything depends on faith. Paul is saying, I'm laying aside everything that I knew. See, that's a challenge. That's a challenge for us. If we're all honest, it's a challenge to say, I'm going to change allegiances and not depend on the things that I've always known. And it also takes courage to be able to look at your life with the magnifying glass of truth and acknowledge, I don't trust God in certain areas of my life. I don't trust him with my body because I run to the world to get it fixed. I don't trust him with my resources because I run to the banks and the accountants and the mortgage companies and the investment companies. Like I said, there's nothing wrong with any of these. I, I understand what, don't, don't make me say that, well, now you can't use a bank. You can't do 401ks. <laughs> you should never go to a doctor. I'm not telling you that. You go where you need to, you feel you need to go. But I, what I've said to you before in here is that I'm going to preach the highest level of faith. Yes. Come on. Kenneth E. Hagen, Dad Hagen, Brother Hagen, used to say that. I'd rather reach for the moon yeah. and make it halfway yeah. than to, re to, to yeah. only believe halfway and not make it there either. Come on. That's right. So when you hear me say certain that's things, you, you may in your mind go, well, that's just unattainable. Well, as long as you believe it is, it will be. When we talk about divine health and, 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 and you think, well, man, I, I don't know anybody that's living in divine health. Well, then you don't know Jesus. Ooh. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a big one. Walk around like, I know Jesus. He's like my best friend, but I don't know anybody that's ever walked in divine health. Well, then you don't know Jesus quite as well as you think you did because he is a real person. Yes, he is. And he's still living. Yes, he is. And he walked on this earth in divine health. Yes, he did. So if he's the only one you knew, that is enough to know that you can have it as well. That's because right. he walked on this earth in a human body yes, with like passions and like challenges. Yeah. Come on. We're talking about resurrection power. Yeah, come on. Let's go on reading. For God's way of making us right within health depends on faith. Verse 10. This is the verse I wanted to get to. As a result, I can really know Christ. Again, not know about him. 
Paul's saying, if I lay this stuff aside, if I begin to discard these things that I once knew out of my life, if I begin to lay them down, if I begin to die to self, if I begin to stop becoming dependent or being dependent on the world system and begin to make that shift in my life and begin to become dependent upon the kingdom system. Because see, there are two systems. There's a world system and a kingdom system. And the Bible clearly states that we're in this world and not of it, which means when we got born again, you are no longer part of the world system. You are part of a kingdom system. But if you don't know what the kingdom system is, if you're still leaning on the world system to have your needs met, whatever that looks like, in your physical body, in your resources, in your relationships or whatever, as long as you continue to lean on the world system, you're going to get world results. Now, one of the challenging things is, is with that is that you can get results in the world system because man was created in such a way he's pretty good at doing some things. That's right. I mean, look at how far society has advanced since Adam and Eve. And we would love to say and buy into the fact is, well, that's because God's behind all of it. No, he's not. Because when Adam and Eve messed up, God said, you're on your own. Most of what we see is man's attempt to be God and get things right. Come on. That's true. It's not kingdom. It's world. Yeah. Yeah. And you can see by everything in the world that man can do a pretty darn good job. Can we not? <laughs> do you think it was God's plan for there to be automobiles running off of gasoline? to get around. Though that's man's attempt. Because without God, that's the only way you can get around. Jets, trains, planes, and automobiles. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's a movie. Now, you could sit here and think, well, wow, Pastor Steve is just trying to say that I can't use anything, I can't do anything. unless I'm not telling you that. I'm not saying that at all. We still live in this world, you know. But what I'm saying is there's a higher way with God. And Paul is saying here in verse 10, as a result of discarding all these ideas, all these things about being right and all the things that I've accomplished and all... I'm going to set, as a result of setting these things aside, I can really know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. Paul is setting a requisite, uh, uh, setting, setting a, a, a precedent. That's the word. Thank you. My wordsmith. <laughs> Paul is setting a precedent here saying that to the degree you're willing to set aside all the things that you know, all the things that you've been taught, all the influence that the world has had on your life, because we've all been influenced by it, because we live in it, to the degree and to the level that you're willing to set that aside, which then opens up a door to know him, not of him, but know him, and... He says here, and I love this because in the New Living, and experience. To know him and experience the mighty power of God. But as long as you want to depend on the world system, that's exactly what you'll know. And those are the results that you'll get. But to experience the power, you have to let go of what you know. And you have to trust in who you know. Yes. Not what you know. Yes. The thing is, as many times, and I said it before, it's not knowing about Christ, it's knowing him. Yes. What we'll do many times is because we know about Christ the same way with we know about some things of this world. Well, I, I know about fishing. Have you ever gone fishing? No, but I know about it. Yeah. I've, I've watched some of the best, man. I, I watch Bass Masters and I watch yeah. this and... You know, Jimmy Houston. Yeah. S- Saturday mornings. Yeah. 
Saturday mornings, if you got Cox Cable, man, I'm going to tell you right now, Saturday morning, Channel 24, <laughs> starts at 7 o'clock. Depending on the time of season, it's, it would be Major League Bass Fishing. And after Major League Bass Fishing, it's Catching the Sun. Catching the Sun. It's another guy, man, he's fishing down in the waters of, of Florida, and he's fishing and catching tarpon and, and catching all kinds of fish. Come on. But if all you ever do is watch them and never experience it, you know the, the, the logistics, but you don't really know it. You can tell me that, yeah, if you use this bait and if you buy this rod, and how do you know that? Well, because someone told me. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people in the body of Christ that live their Christian life that way. Do you know Jesus and have you experienced him? Tell me your testimony. See, that's why I've been pushing so much over the last couple of years about your testimony. Don't let your testimony be somebody else's testimony because then you really don't know or have experienced the power of God. You're just telling me about somebody else's experience yeah. with the power of God. Right. But you don't really know it yourself. But when you can tell me what God's done in your life, when you can tell me that you've experienced resurrection power yeah. because what God has done in your life, yeah. and your response when someone says, well, what about faith? Well, brother so-and-so said, I don't give a rat's behind what brother so-and-so said. What do you say about faith? What do you say? What do you know about faith? Because faith has worked in your life. Yeah. Because trusting God yes. has worked in your life. Yes. And not to, not to speak less of a testimony that you have, but you ought to have more than a testimony of what happened 20 years ago. Come on. You ought to have current testimonies. If not daily, at least weekly. If not weekly, come on, at least have a monthly testimony. And if not monthly, you ought to have at least one or two testimonies that have happened to you in the last 12 months. If not, then you really don't know Christ and our experiences, his power, as much as what you lead on to. If it's always, well, you know, God did this 20 years ago, that's wonderful. We even see it in the scriptures in the Old Testament where God had them build monuments and everything. So when they come back around, they'd remember that. So I'm not saying discard an Old Testimony. That's wonderful. But if that's the only testimony you've got every time you talk about something, you need to ask yourself why. Why don't you have something fresh? Why haven't you experienced the power of God just recently in your life? And the thing is, is I'm not saying that the power of God hasn't been at work. It might be that you're so comfortable that you don't even recognize the power of God working. That's why I've even said, have been preaching, especially more on Wednesday nights than on Sundays. For those of you that, that you need to come on Wednesday nights, man, yeah. our Bible study, our discussion. Yeah. That's why I say so much, and I've said it on Wednesday nights, is begin to see God moving in your life every day because if you see him moving, and he is, he is. every single day, you'll have fresh testimony, fresh manna. There's fresh manna coming from heaven every day. And whether you know it or not, you're actually partaking of it. You say, well, how do you know that, Pastor Steve? You're sitting here in front of me. You say, what does that mean? You've got life in your body. Do you know how wonderful a testimony that is? We just take it for granted. Well, you know, I just lived for 80 or 90 years. That's just the way it is. That's life. I mean, that's just life. That's just life. It's just life. It's just life. No, because everything that's going on in this world, I mean, just the last year, COVID in itself, the fact that he protected you from it, 
And if you happen to be someone that got it, the fact of the matter is, is you got on the other side of it, based upon what the facts that they try to tell you on is, well, you know, you got such a percentage that you might die, and if you've got this in your body, you might die, and if you've got that in your body, you might die, and my gosh, you don't want to get COVID-19, and my gosh, wear a mask. And, oh, matter of fact, one mask isn't good enough, a double mask, because we just determined that the little particles can get through the first mask, so wear a double mask. Well, maybe you need to wear three masks, because now we've determined that those little particles can get first, through the first two layers, and we need you need to put a third layer on. It's like, oh my gosh. And then after a full year, just recently, the CDC just comes out, and this isn't a COVID message, I understand. <laughs> But the CDC just recently came out and said, you know all the malarkey, and they didn't use this word, I'm just saying it, because that's, that's what it is. You know all the malarkey we've been giving you about disinfecting everything? We've determined that it doesn't do one bit of good. So we apologize, and like I said, they didn't say this either, I'm saying this. We apologize that you've spent thousands of dollars on extra toilet paper, extra sanitary wipes, extra Lysol wipes, extra micro spray, extra this, extra that, and that you've thrown an extra two or three hours of time into your day not accomplishing what you should be accomplishing because you're wiping everything down. You're wiping everything down. You're wiping everything down. And they've come out and they said, we found out that only one out of every 10,000 people might get COVID from an unsanitary surface. Well, I didn't need them to tell me that. I got the Holy Ghost. It's like, come on, man. But see, they'll try to present the facts to you. Scientific facts. One scientist will say it's this way. Another scientist will say it's that way. Another scientist will say it's this way. And why? They're guessing. But when you know Christ and experience the power of his resurrection, as Paul is saying, I'm forgetting all that stuff. I'm laying it aside. I can't, I, I can't, Paul is saying, I can't trust that anymore yeah. because it's subject to change. Yeah. Yes. I mean, we saw that with the whole COVID thing. How much change has come over the last 14 months? Right. First it's this, and then it's that, and then it's this, and then it's that. And go do this, and don't do that. Go over here, and don't go there. Don't touch this, and go ahead, touch this. Da, 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 da. It sounds like the law that was in the Old Testament. Don't touch this, but go ahead and touch that. Don't say this, but say Come this. That's what it is. Rules. Law. What does the law do? Kills. Kills. It separates you from God, does not bring you closer to God, separates you from God, separates you from knowing him and who he really is, who is the nature and character. See, that's what God wants us to know, the true nature and character, which is love. And if you know love, the person, don't you know that he'll keep you safe? Don't you know that he'll protect you? Don't you know that he'll watch over you? Don't you know that he'll cover you with his grace and with his mercy and with his blood? Come on. To know as a result, Paul says, as a result of all this, I'm, I'm done bragging about what I know. I'm done bragging about my education. I'm done bragging about what I've learned. But there's a new way of learning. See, that's what the Bible says over in Matthew 6 and 33. It's one of my favorite scriptures. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all this other stuff will be taken care of or be added unto you. What's he really saying here? Seek first the kingdom. When you get born again, there's a new way of living. And it's going to take some effort to seek out this new way of living, this new life, this new lifestyle. It's not the same of what you're used to. Run here to get your need met. Run there to get this. Run over here. It's now seek first. It's 
go after only. You could say it that way. It's go after only. Seeking first could be said only. I seek only kingdom way of living. But if you don't know, and see, that's why it's important to be in church on Sunday morning. That's why it's important to go to Bible studies. That's why it's important to go to corporate prayer. That's why it's important to have your own study time at home. That's why it's important to have your own prayer life at home. But all of them are important because we're in an ever state of learning the new kingdom way, the new kingdom system. There's a new system. And I don't say this to... To disrespect, that's the word I wanted. I'm not saying what I'm about to say to disrespect our nation and our constitution by any means because there's men and women that have died and given their lives to have that. But the kingdom way of life is even greater than our constitution and bill of rights. That's right. Yes, it is. Thank you, Jesus. I'm telling you, the kingdom way, because yes, the, the, the framers of our constitution... The framers of our bill and rights, of our bill and rights, they were chasing after God. That's why they came here. Yeah, right. They wanted a better life yes, with God. Yes. But that constitution and bill of rights, and like I say, I'm not saying this to disrespect or to cast aside, but I am saying this, that that is just a small, 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 small picture of man's view of God and he put it into a document which is a wonderful document it's a valuable document it is valuable to us but there is so much more than the constitution and the bill of rights there is so much more to kingdom living we live underneath a new government as a believer that government is run by the Lord Jesus Christ he is the one that sits on the throne He is the one that sits on the throne, not a man as we would know as a man. Yes, he's a man. Yes, he's still alive. But (laughs) I'm going to avoid mentioning names. But there is none other than Jesus Christ and a born-again child of God that is sitting at the right hand of the Father, which is the place of power and authority. And if you think there is, you better go to God and talk to him about it. Because you're putting your trust in somebody or something that you shouldn't put your trust Come in. On now. Good, Amen. But it says, seek first the kingdom of God, which means you're seeking first a new life, a new way, a new government, a new way to live. That new way to live, we see just a small picture of it with Adam and Eve because the picture that we see there, we see they messed up pretty quick. We really don't know how much time there was, I don't think, between the time that they were created and they messed up in the garden. But what we do see was pretty short-lived based upon Scripture. But what we see more about the kingdom way of life is Jesus. Now, we don't see, for the most part, the first 30 years. So we don't know what Jesus did in that 30 years, the first 30, other than he was about his father's business, which tells me that even though Jesus came from heaven, he was still looking into the scriptures. He was in the temple with the others, doctors of the law and everything, and he was reading about the way things were to be. He was learning because it says he grew in stature. He grew in favor. Which means Jesus was learning. But we do see a great snapshot of the three years of his ministry. And really, I can't even say the full three years. Depending on where you look and study, they tell you that the, the, the three years of his ministry, what we have in the Bible is about 27 days of his ministry. Which we're missing, we're missing a, a little better than two and three quarters of the testimonies. That's why when it says that all the books could not contain, we got 27 days worth. That's what they say. I don't know how they figured that out. That makes no difference to me. I just know what is in there is truth. That's right. <laughs> and if that's what he did in 27 days of it, it tells me that he did the same thing in the other two years and 350 
345 days. 342 days, 348 days, 338 days. Just give me a minute if you run the numbers through my head. The other two years and 338 days. That'll give you your 365. There you go. It's like every time something came out, I was like, that ain't right. <laughs> then my head captured. 338 plus 27, 365. That's it. 338 days. So what do you think of that? <laughs> Come on. That's 1,068 days if you don't want to use years. Figure it out. Okay, you count that all is done. I forget those things that are behind right. me. Count that all is done. Why did I say that? Oh, because Jesus is the picture of kingdom life. Yeah, yeah, that's right. yeah. Everything Jesus did was kingdom life. He didn't do anything in this world. He did not depend on this world for anything. That's right. That's right. And you see it all throughout scripture. He spoke to dead bodies. They came back to life. He spoke to sicknesses and diseases, and they died and departed. There are certain things he didn't even speak to. He just exuded the power of the kingdom out of himself. Yeah. People would just come up like the one with the issue, but they would just come up and touch him. He didn't say anything. He didn't do anything. He just, when, when she touched him, he just turned around and he said, someone took a little bit of the power. Who was it? When he needed money to pay taxes. He told the disciples, hey, go catch a fish. And get some money out of his mouth. When's the last time you ever thought about going to catch a fish to pay your bill? Never. <laughs> and if you ever do it and get it, do not let the government know that you can go fishing <laughs> to get money because they'll tax you. So which means you're either going to have to catch more fish or figure out another way to get some money. What did he do when he was in a multitude of 5,000 people? To feed them with just a few loaves and some fishes. He just lifted it up, blessed it, and broke it, and began to distribute it. He just broke and blessed what he had and began to distribute. Yeah. And when it was all said and done, every one of them ate, and there was 12 baskets left over. That's the God of more than enough. I'm a firm believer that the, the part that was left over is because God's like, you got 12 disciples, because it says there was 12 baskets. You got 12 disciples here, and you're going to be going on to another work. You're going to be traveling. You're going to need to take some things with you. He sees ahead and makes provision. He spoke to wind. This is, these are all, see, we need to understand everything that we read in here, this is kingdom life. Yeah. And you're a kingdom citizen. That's right. And if you're a kingdom citizen, you have the right to function and operate underneath the guides of kingdom life. Yes. Thank you, Lord. That's the power of God. The power of God released into the earth, which is kingdom life released into the earth by the Holy Ghost. That's why Jesus said, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, go and be endued with power. There has been resurrection power that has been given you, that raised you, put a brand new spirit in you. Now that you are born again, you still need the power of the Holy Ghost. That is now the ability to operate in the power to function in that power, to function in the power that raised you from death, that raised you out of from separation of God, now go and be endued with power so you can begin to be my witnesses. Be my witnesses, what does that mean? It means put on display the kingdom life. See, to be a true witness is not to talk about what Jesus did, it's going and demonstrating what Jesus did. 
That's why Jesus says, the works that I do, you're going to do also. If you're not doing the works that he did, simply means, it could really mean one of two things. You've either not been endued with power, which means you've not received the Holy Ghost like the book of Acts says, or you're still leaning on the ways of this world. The ways of this world will short circuit. God will not supersede the ways of this world unless you ask him to supersede the ways of this world. Until you demonstrate the power. Until you, as I would say, put a demand on the power. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Turn over there. I'll try and close with this scripture because it's 1145. I love to hear, is it really? That tells me that I'm not worried out yet. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> Now, the King James, bring it up, bring Acts 10 19 up in the King James, not the New King James, the King James. Yeah, well, 10, Acts or Luke? Luke. Luke chapter 10, verse 19 in the King James. Luke, or Luke, Luke. chapter 10, verse 19. Okay. Luke 10, 19. Luke 10, 19 in the King James. Okay. I don't have the King James, so I'm waiting for him to bring it up. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now, you don't need, just verse 19 was good. Now I'm going to read it out of the New King James because this, the New King James is actually more rightly, or is more correct in the verbiage, the words. It says, behold, I give you the authority. Notice in the King James it says, Behold, I give you power. Power is the wrong word there. It should be the word authority. Because we have the power. The key is, is he's given us the authority to exercise that power. Because if you don't know you have authority to exercise the power, you can have all the power you want and it means no difference. I've used a simple example of this building, is we have all kinds of power to this building, and we pay our power bill. Because the, bill, the power is provided to this building through SDG&E, and we pay our power bill, we have the authority to go over and hit that switch and expect lights to come on. Well, see, Jesus paid the power bill. So we have the right to expect when we place a demand on it that that power is going to be released. We're not demanding God to do anything. He's made it available. We're placing a demand on the power to accomplish what we want accomplished. Now, going back to Philippians chapter 3, Paul says, I forget those things, which means you need to change your place of where you place your demand. Are you, when it comes to being sick, are you placing your demand on the medical community to get you better? Because if you are, they may or may not get it right. Matter of fact, I've said this before and I'll say it again. The number three killer in the United States, number three, the only thing that supersedes it is heart disease and cancer. The number three killer in the United States is misdiagnosis from the medical community. So God bless you if you're going to place your demand on something that you have a one in three chance of dying. Because they may get it wrong, which means they may prescribe a medicine to you that may kill you. Or they may just not get it right, and the medicine that they prescribe may not kill you. Now, I'm not saying don't go to a doctor. You know what? If you are, feel comfortable and safe going to a doctor, then go. But I, like I said earlier, I'm going to preach the highest level. Kingdom way of living, God wants us to not be dependent or become less dependent upon the world system. And more dependent upon him. That's in every arena. 
every arena of our life, in our physical bodies, he wants us to become less dependent on the world system and more dependent upon him. Resources, he wants us to become less dependent upon the world system and more dependent upon him. Relationships, he wants us to become less dependent upon the world system and what they say is a good relationship and more dependent upon him because he shows us a picture of what a good relationship is. In any other area that you can think of that you know you're dependent upon the world and maybe you've become less dependent, praise the Lord. That's where we should be, yeah. is continually to, to strive to wean ourselves off yeah. of the dependency yeah. of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Wean ourselves off the dependency of the world. The world even knows the benefit of that because the world will teach you that when you raise your kids, the, right, the world will tell you this. The proper way to raise your kids is to wean them off of your dependency so that when they become adults... The only problem is, is the world will say, lean them off of your dependency so they can become dependent on the world system. As a believer, as a Christian, we should wean them off of your dependency or seeing you as their source and begin to get them to become dependent in their own relationship with Christ. So that when they grow and mature and they leave the nest, or in some cases get thrown out of the nest, (laughs) They know who to trust. And they don't come back to you when they're 40 years old and go, I got myself in a terrible predicament. I need to borrow $30,000. Now, if God moves on, and and this is a fine line, because in many cases, I'm talking to parents right now, and I'm talking to grandparents right now. I'm talking to grandparents right now. (laughs) is we think the responsibility of taking care of them and bailing them out is a never-ending, lifelong deal. No, it's not. Now, if God moves on your heart to help your child or your grandchild, help them. If God moves on your heart, the fine line is, is we get a mindset that I'm mama or I'm daddy or I'm grandma, or I'm grandpa, and that's just the way it is. No, it's not. It's what God says. God should always be the determining factor. I don't care who you are or what title you hold. I don't care. Because there's going to be a day where mama, or daddy, or grandma, or grandpa is not going to be here. So now... Who's going to help the child that doesn't know how to trust God? So don't let those titles and that love cause you to cripple your child or grandchild to where they're dependent upon you. But we think because we're a parent or a grandparent, that's our right. And that's my job. No, it's not. Your job is to train a child up in the way that they should go. And the way that they should go is to begin to follow Jesus for themselves and trust in him for themselves. But if they're still turning to you every time they get into trouble and get into predicament, you've not trained them in the way that they should go because they're following you. Whoo. Come on, get quiet in this Presbyterian house. (laughs) It helps all of us. I'm telling you what, we we live it every single day. We've we've lived it with our son. Have I not helped our son? Absolutely I've helped him when the Spirit of God has told me to help him. And it's a hard thing when the Spirit of God says, nope, he's going to need to figure this out on his own or he's going to have to trust me. Especially when you have the means yeah. or the ability to help them. Yeah. And the Spirit of God says no. Yeah. Everything on the inside of me is a father. Everything on the inside of her is a mother. is just like, 
but we have to lift our hands off. Yes. And you'll even get the kickback and the repercussion and the, well, you're my parents. I can't believe you won't help me. It's like, yeah, well, <laughs> get over it. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like, you know, get over it. Get over yourself. I'm sorry. You may not understand why I'm doing it, but in the long run, it's going to be because there's going to be a day where I'm not going to be here, and you're going to have to trust God for yourself. Or substitute me for some other world system to have your need met. And I'll tell you what, some would think it's hard to walk in faith, but it's a lot easier trusting God and becoming proficient about trusting God and the power of God for him to change the situation in your life than it is running from doctor to doctor to specialist to specialist to doctor to doctor to specialist to specialist until you're waiting to hear the report that you want to hear. Well, who gives a rest behind what report they tell you? Because you've got a report that is unfailing. Do you need any other report than this? Because if you do, that I'm just going to be straight up telling you, you're not in faith. You're not. If the doctor's report is the determining factor whether or not you're okay, you're not in faith. Because this is the report that is truth. The doctor's report may be fact. I started the whole message out that way. But this is the report that's truth. So regardless of what the doctor tells you, come on, come on, and praise the Lord, he may tell you something that lines up with truth. Hallelujah. But what if he doesn't? What if he doesn't? What are you going to do then? What are you going to do then? We have to ask ourselves, what if the bank account's in a negative balance? You can't make your house payment. You can't pay your energy bill. You can't do this. The fact is that I got no money. The truth is, is that your father owns the cattle on a thousand hills and all the silver and gold. That's the truth. Well, he just doesn't seem to be giving me any of it because my, I got bills. Maybe you got bills because you did some things and made some decisions that created the bill that wasn't his plan. So what do you do then? Does that mean I just have to suffer the consequences? No. James tells us you just need to humble yourself and say, Father, forgive me for rebelling against what you were telling me and what not to buy or what not to do or not go over here, not go over there. Forgive me for walking in rebellion against your direction in my life, which is the Holy Ghost, which is going back to what Paul said, to know and experience Christ. Forgive me for rebelling against you and wanting my own way and leaning against on the world system, which is Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Synchrony Bank, which if any of you have any credit cards, you'll find out that Synchrony Bank owns about 90% of all credit. Really? <laughs> Leaning on that to get it. Come on, Pastor, help us. Come on. It's knowing Christ and experiencing his power. Yeah. That happens when you begin to turn your back on or wean yourself off of the world's ways. The more you wean yourself off the world's ways, the more you'll experience yes. him yes. and his power. Yeah. But as long as you are dependent upon it, you will get the results of it. The thing is, as I said earlier, I'll just close with this statement, is we've all done it. We get results the world's way. And because we get results, we'll even chalk that up as God results. No, it ain't. It's world's results. Well, I went to the doctor, and they gave me a medication, and I got off it. Oh, well, chalk it up to God, or is it the world's way? It's the world's way. I don't want to burst anybody's bubble, but it's the world's way. Because if you're laying in a hospital bed, and you're a born-again believer, and you're dealing with this particular symptom, and then you got a guy laying next to you in the bed next to you in the same room that is full-blown heathen, drug user, partier, and he gets delivered 
from the same thing that you got delivered. Was it God? Maybe. But my guess is it was the world. And the world system, you will get results. And then in the world system, you won't. Because if it was all God, then the doctors would always get it right. And they wouldn't be the ones that are the number three killer in the United States. <laughs> Yay! So, when Paul said, I lay all that aside, I consider it all worthless, because my one thing, everybody say, my one thing, my one thing is to know, Christ to know Christ and to experience, and to experience his, power. his power. Amen. Let's pray. Father, yeah. we thank you this morning. <laughs> Whew. Thank you, Jesus, for the Holy Ghost. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you that the word this morning, Father God, challenges us yes. to become less dependent upon the world and more dependent upon you. To grow in truth, to become closer to you, to hear you better, to know your voice better, to respond to your voice better. And to become less dependent upon the voices of the world and what the world tells us and how to get ahead or how to overcome, how to be successful. Because we, as born-again children of God, are kingdom citizens. And because we're kingdom citizens, there is a new set of of ways to live in and to function in that far surpass the ways of this world. 